Legacy Precious Metals is the company that I trust to give you good and patient counsel for investing in your retirement. The Biden administration has caused a financial crisis and they have no clue how to fix it. Oil prices have skyrocketed and when oil prices go up, not only do your expenses go up, but the cost of transportation and shipping spikes, leading the prices of goods to rise. And when and we are already seeing record inflation. That's the last thing that we need. Our economy is in trouble and you need to take steps to protect yourself. If all your money is tied up in stocks, bonds, and traditional markets, you may be vulnerable. So gold is one of the very best ways to protect your retirement. No matter what happens, you own your own gold. It's real, it's physical, and it's always been valuable since the dawn of time. Call Legacy Precious Metals today at 866-528-1903 or visit them online at LegacyPMInvestments.com. That's LegacyPMInvestments.com where you can download the free investor's guide. You can also go to my Facebook page, Jenna Ellis. I am a public figure on Facebook and I just posted yesterday a really great interview with the president of Legacy Precious Metals who is discussing why you need to start your retirement account even if you're in your your 20s or 30s. There is always a great time to protect your retirement and invest just like you want to protect your health over the long term. So go to Legacy Precious Metals at LegacyPMInvestments.com or call 866-528-1903. As a constitutional law attorney, former senior legal advisor and personal counsel to President Donald J. Trump, Jenna Ellis believes in the rule of law and the importance of integrity in our elections. And she's ready to tackle the big cultural and legal issues facing America. This is The Jenna Ellis Show. Here is your host, Jenna Ellis. Happy Tuesday, friends, and welcome to another episode of The Jenna Ellis Show. I'm Jenna Ellis, and of course, the Supreme Court opinions are the biggest news of today, regardless of what you might be seeing in uh, the mainstream media and the crazed leftists. But we want to break down the most important decision of the Supreme Court that came out today. And no, it wasn't Dobbs. So we are still waiting on the Dobbs decision, which, as you know, I don't think that that's going to come out even on Thursday. Uh, they may have it issued on Thursday, but likely it will come down uh, later next week after the court has finished all of its regular business, because now there are even reports and photos that have surfaced online showing that there will be D.C. protesters who are trying to incite a night of rage, quote unquote, to say that if uh, abortions are not safe, then you aren't either. I mean, this is what the insane left is doing. And what they are trying to manipulate is an outcome of a Supreme Court opinion that they don't agree with. And they are willing to literally commit violence, not just in protest, but uh, to actually try to influence the justices' opinion. So this is illegal. It's absurd. And uh, we need to hope and pray that all of the justices are safe and that they will not back down from doing their job upholding the U.S. Constitution, regardless of these uh, you know, crazed minority individuals who are threatening um, these types of violent acts, including uh, protesting outside the justices' homes. Um, and you know, a lot of this just really gross and disturbing rhetoric. There were even videos of um, some young women who had, you know, bloodied pants and had um, baby dolls uh, with them that, in my view, just showed that uh, they recognize that we're talking about human life, that we're talking about um, human babies, and they don't care. They want the outcome that they prefer, and they want to have state-sponsored, state-funded abortion on demand, and they will be relentless in their opposition to the rule of law. But let's talk about the three most important decisions that the Supreme Court uh, issued today. So first, uh, there was a case against Biden's HHS that the Supreme Court in a 9-0, yes, unanimous opinion, said that the Biden administration was unconstitutional. That should be a wake-up flag for the Biden administration, that when he is knowingly and intentionally violating the law and he is abusing his oath of office, and he is acting in policy and conduct from the executive branch that he intentionally knows is a violation of the U.S. Constitution, that's an impeachable offense. A 9-0 opinion saying this is unconstitutional. He knew that at the time that it was implemented because, of course, you know, some policy decisions, some legislative actions will ultimately be overturned at the Supreme Court. That's why the justice uh, system and the judicial branch is the third branch of government to hold our 
to political branches accountable. And so that in and of itself isn't surprising that there would be some actions from the executive or the legislative that are overturned, that it happens quite frequently. But the issue here is that the Biden administration knows what they're doing is completely against the rule of law in many instances. And this particular opinion where the justices are saying very plainly that this is an unconstitutional act and that Biden knew that it was unconstitutional, but he still wants to ram all of these policies through because he's acting like a petty tyrant, he needs to be impeached. Uh, The second case that is very important that I just want to touch on is um, an interesting 7-2 opinion where Justice Thomas and uh, Justice Alito are in the minority. And this was a criminal law issue. And it showed very plainly that uh, Thomas and Alito are the only reliable conservative justices when it comes to uh, criminal law issues. And so read the very brief dissent in this case. It's United States versus Taylor, because Justice Thomas actually just says, you know, listen, you guys are making up this hypothetical uh, defendant and you're saying, well, you know, just because in some other hypothetical fact pattern, um, this guy wouldn't be convicted under this statutory framework, under this federal law. But in this instance, in this case, I would punish the guy for what he actually did. I mean, it was a very plain uh, ruling on centered and focused on reality, centered and focused on the facts. And we need more justices with the framework and the courage and ability to simply uh, have rational reality like Justice Thomas. Um, But the third case that I want to focus on before I bring on my great guest today, Ron Coleman, who's a fellow attorney, um, dear friend of mine, for some expert analysis. One of the cases that we in the conservative uh, legal community have been highly anticipating is Carson versus Macon. And this is what my friend uh, Corey DeAngelis, who is an advocate for school choice, you need to be following him. Uh, he tweeted this, breaking the U.S. Supreme Court just ruled in a 6-3 decision that preventing school choice families from taking their children's taxpayer funded education dollars to religious private schools violated the free exercise clause of the First Amendment. And uh, that's a really great summary. And going on, um, Chief Justice Roberts said that writing for the majority said Maine's non-sectarian requirement for its otherwise generally available tuition assistance payments violates the free exercise clause of the First Amendment. Regardless of how the benefit and restriction are described, the program operates to identify and exclude otherwise eligible schools on the basis of their religious exercise. The judgment of the Court of Appeals is reversed, and the case is remanded for further proceedings consistent with this opinion. And so um, so the issue here was that Maine has this rule that when uh, parents and, you know, obviously taxpayers are taxed uh, and their dollars then go back into this school choice program because Maine can't accommodate all of uh, the children in Maine for public school. They have to have some school choice options, which is increasingly uh, the position of most states. They have a school choice program that provides tuition assistance to families, particularly in areas that live, uh, you know, a certain mileage away from the nearest public school. And so some parents and the petitioners in this case wanted to use their tuition assistance dollars to be able to send their children to a sectarian or a religious institution, like a Catholic school or a Christian school. And uh, the state of Maine challenged that and said, well, you know, no, the, uh, the First Amendment and, you know, the Establishment Clause says that we can't prefer uh, any sort of religious uh, religious institution. And so public dollars can't be sent, spent on religious education. But um, the pushback to that and the correct opinion in this case is that the government can't prohibit parents from using their uh, their school choice and their taxpayer funded available dollars to select a school of their choice. So what they're actually doing in Maine by saying, no, you can't use your school choice dollars for a sectarian and religious uh, school and institution is discriminating on the basis of religion and viewpoint. Because if you can use your taxpayer dollars and your school choice dollars to choose any school you want, but the only schools that are unavailable to you are the ones that also happen to be 
a, a Catholic school, a Christian school, even a Muslim school, any sort of school that is um, specifically a religious viewpoint, then that's actually discrimination that is a violation of the First Amendment. So uh, this went back to the Trinity Lutheran case. The, uh, the G- Chief Justice Roberts, in his majority opinion, cited that case, which was decided several years ago, I believe um, 2016 or 17. Uh, that was a similar issue, that um, the state there did not want to allow uh, a taxpayer-funded program that was for uh, repaving uh, schoolyards so that you could have that kind of soft astroturf for kids to play on in playgrounds. Um, The state in that instance said, well, we will fund this program for any schools that are not religious, but if you have a playground that's attached to a religious school, then you can't benefit from this statewide available program. And the court in that case said, no, you can't discriminate against Trinity Lutheran simply because its playground is attached to a religious school. A scraped knee is a scraped knee, whether or not a child who's playing on a playground and falls off on AstroTurf or on rocks uh, is is playing at a church school or a religious school or a secular school. The playground is the playground is the playground. And in the same way, uh, here in Carson versus Macon, it established um, yet another really good precedent that said that um, school choice dollars cannot discriminate specifically against a religious viewpoint. And that is a violation of the First Amendment's Establishment Clause. So this is um, yet another of what is continues to be a good line of precedent from the current Supreme Court that is protecting religious liberty, protecting uh, just rational thought, and protecting the ability of uh, parents, of schools, and um, in the realm of education, protecting the ability of um, religious institutions to not be discriminated by the state simply because they have a religious viewpoint in their education. So this is a great opinion. We are still waiting, like I said, on the Dobbs opinion. We're also still waiting on the Coach Kennedy case, which of course is the football coach who uh, prayed, um, took a couple moments by himself to kneel at the 50-yard line after his high school games in a moment of silent prayer. That's going to be an important religious liberty opinion. That one likely is going to come down on Thursday. That is the next opinion day of the court. Uh, Whether or not Dobbs comes down that day, we'll definitely let you know. Um, Again, it's my prediction, could be wrong, but it's my prediction that the Supreme Court is going to wait uh, for Dobbs to be its very last item of business before retiring from this term for their three-month a sabbatical before they start um, back in October, just because of the security issues and the vitriol. But we'll be right back with Ron Coleman because I want to break down the law, the philosophy, and the precedent of why this particular case in Carson v. Macon is so important to understand from the perspective, not just of religious freedom, but also of the First Amendment. We'll be right back. All right. Well, 2022 is going to be a critical year for America. AMAC, the Association of Mature American Citizens, along with their nearly 2 million members. The fight to stop out-of-control spending in the president's Build Back Better scheme is far from over, and Congress is plotting more legislation that could hurt our seniors. The midterm elections will be a battle for freedom versus socialism. Unlike liberal groups, AMAC is America's conservative, action-oriented 50-plus organization fighting hard every day here in Washington and across the nation for our seniors. So I'm urging you to choose AMAC now. You will receive all of the great membership benefits, including AMAC discounts on hotels, travels, and restaurants, and your membership will support your conservative values. So go to amac.us forward slash Ellis. That's amac.us forward slash E-L-L-I-S to become an AMAC member now now. All right. So for more on this and to break down a great analysis of Carson v. Macon, joining me now is my good friend, Ron Coleman, who is a brilliant lawyer, works with our good friend, Harmeet Dillon, and also is the host of his own podcast, which everyone should be listening to, Coleman Nation Podcast. Follow him on Twitter. And Ron, so great to see you. Jenna, thank you. It's nice to see you as well. Yeah, I always love getting my friends who are brilliant lawyers to come on and uh, have this great conversation because, you know, we do this offline uh, all the time where I love being able to call my friends and just say, hey, what do you think about this case and kind of have this analysis. And so to be able to have these kinds of discussions for 
um, our audiences and to bring people in who maybe aren't lawyers and kind of get uh, really the heart of the issue here is a lot of fun. So uh, right off the top, what was your overall impression of the opinion in Carson v. Macon and also the breakdown? I I think we all expected kind of the uh, where each of the justices fell. Yeah, I I don't think there are too many surprises there. I I think that... um, you know, Breyer, in terms of the dissenters, Breyer remains in his own bizarre orbit. Uh, and the younger left-wing judges are, there's nothing bizarre about their, about their point of view. It's a received liberal point of view. They're still harping, and as Breyer actually does in, in his opinion, on the vaunted separation between church and state, which is a dubious... Uh, gloss on the First Amendment, freedom of religion, and establishment clauses. Um, and you know, the court hasn't actually officially thrown that phrase on the ash heap of history, but this opinion certainly helps. Yeah, and they should. And we are still, of course, awaiting the decision in uh, the Coach Kennedy case, which uh, I believe will probably likely come out Thursday. And uh, that's another kind of entanglement of religion case, uh, of course, there. And uh, my hope is that the Lemon Test, which is another sort of antiquated uh, case from the 1970s that should also go into the dustbin of history, uh, will be overturned or at least severely restricted in that case. Uh, Do you think that they're going to specifically mention separation of church and state in that opinion if they haven't in this one? I would think not. You know, the, the, the thing about the Roberts court is that it is so darned incremental. Mm. Um, I mean, we wouldn't be here today uh, in Carson if it hadn't been for the fact that in Espinoza, uh, they were so cautious. We need not decide today. We they, they, they If there's ever been a phrase that they just automatically have, you know, a key, a, a, you know, a macro for in the Supreme Court. It's we, we need not decide today. It, it was, it should have been obvious that this distinction that they threw out between religious use and religious, uh, what, you know, what was the term again? Um, religious use and, and religious uh, affiliation, not affiliation, but identification was preposterous and 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 that, and as the as the decision actually acknowledges there is no way if you want to go back to the lemon test which as of this opinion is still alive there's no way to animate the distinction between religious use and, and religious identity without entanglement which is one of the prohibitions under the lemon test the state's not supposed to open up the drawers and you know rip through the, rip through the files in order to find out what kind of religious stuff is going on? They, we, there's a there's a really longstanding judicial reluctance to second guess religiosity. Mm-hmm. So there's no question that here the court squared that circle and said no. It, it, there's no distinction once once you have a religious school. Let's face it, money's fungible. Mm-hmm. What are you going to tell you know? You're going to tell me that this money goes to the sinks and the cafeteria and the English department, and it has no effect whatsoever on the chapel or the religious destruction. We do drawing lines is part of the judicial endeavor. There's a point at which you've got to make the call, but here, pretending to have made the call between these, you know these two rather abstract concepts didn't make any sense. So I think we're moving in a, in a good direction. Yeah. And I like that they invoked the Trinity Lutheran case, which of course, in that case with our uh, good friends from the Alliance Defending Freedom that argued and ultimately won uh, and prevailed in that case, uh, their big catchphrase of that case was, uh, was of course, you know, it was a, a prohibition that the the state in that case or the county didn't want to uh, provide funding for, um, for some of that soft turf to build a playground at a, uh, at a sectarian school, at a religious school, where they were providing money for playgrounds for any other types of schools. And they said, well, you know, kids are kids and a scraped knee is a scraped knee. And that's what they said. You know, you can't parse the difference between um, a child who's playing at a religious playground versus one that's a secular playground. And it just, it, it begins to me to be completely absurd because while we can and we should in a lot of judicial instances parse some of these distinctions and 
uh, separate one case from another. And of course, you know, we analogize or we distinguish, and that's part and parcel to the entire appellate process. <clears throat> For the average person looking at a case like this, it just seems so plainly obvious that the First Amendment was meant for the government to not favor or disfavor religion, period. And so cases like this, it seems like a lot of times because of the Supreme Court living in kind of an ivory tower that has the ability to take months and months and months to parse these different particular areas, sometimes drawing these lines begins to be kind of an exercise um, in academia rather than in just grounded and rooted in fact. Or you might say uh, they're, they're, they're trying to count how many principles can dance on the head of a secular pin. Um, the fact is, the, 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 the good thing is, you know, you talk about people who are, who are not lawyers or even lawyers who are not used to this kind of litigation. The, the, the beauty of Carson is that you would it, typically in, in a in a fairly blue state, the reaction to this kind of decision and and to the previous decisions that were sort of anticipating this decision would be, well, then hell with it. We're not going to subsidize any private schools. Drop dead. Maine can't do that. They simply can't. There's not enough money and there's not enough infrastructure and and the entire the geography and the and the social the way Maine works is they need to subsidize private schools as a way to get all the kids educated and the opinion makes that very clear they're going to subsidize private schools and uh, it's efficient it would be stupid it would it would it, it would be a cut off your nose a spite your face kind of thing and again it's not as if the left is eminently capable of doing that but in Maine, they can't do it. So since the Maine Constitution requires that there be education made available to every student, mm -hmm. and since Maine can't provide a public school education for every student, it has to subsidize private schools. And what the Supreme Court says is, do that. That's fine. You can subsidize private schools. You have to subsidize all private schools. And what Breyer doesn't seem to get is we're not, we're not in the 50s anymore, okay? This idea of you know, if, if a, every penny that goes towards what could end up being a religious use is an entanglement or, or some kind of First Amendment violation, that, that was a dumb idea to the extent that it was ever the law and it should never have been the law in the first place. Yeah, I, I fully agree with you. And it's it's still the same perspective as well, broadly, that I have on um, a lot of the things like boycotts, where people uh, who are conservatives, very well-meaning, are saying, you know, none of my dollars are ever going to go toward anything woke. And I'm like, hilarious that you're saying this on Facebook as a social platform. I mean, it's just, and probably right. on your iPhone and probably, you know, I mean, there's just living in the course of regular American life, there are necessary entanglements with everything because we all live in this kind of society that touches and concerns a lot of different factors that we can't so easily compartmentalize and silo to our different tribalistic uh, preferences. And I think that this case makes that very clear and is a very rational decision. And what practical effect do you see this having on the school choice arguments in, in the political sphere? Well, that's a great question. I mean, school, you know, the school choice argument is really about one thing, and it's about teachers unions. Everything else is simply a, is window dressing for that. Teachers unions have tremendous control over the uh, public education in virtually every state, they drive the bus. And this is a, f and the, the public, the school choice fight is a fight over money and over control uh, of curriculum. So I would actually venture to say that this decision will have nothing, no effect on that debate because it will make the teachers that much more desperate, that's for sure, the teachers' unions, because what this decision says is that, guess what? Money's coming to private schools. More money in, is coming to private schools. Is Maine a model for the whole country? No. There are plenty of states where there isn't sub, any kind of subsidy to private schools. But 
there are lots that are, and I'm not the I'm not the the guest uh, to 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 tell you what percentage there are, but private schools are an important part of the of the American landscape. So I think it is going to. The thing is, how much more set and ideological and uncompromising do the teachers unions have to be? They they couldn't be. They're already up against the, that wall over there on the left. Uh, so. I don't think it's going to have much of an effect at all. It's just going to give a little bit more power, a little bit more leverage to, um, you know, to, to, to school choice advocates, although that seems to be a splintering debate from what I'm seeing. I mean, we've got to maybe check in with Chris Rufo and see what I'm missing here. All of a sudden, it's become a one of those internecine grift and... I, I don't. I don't follow these things very well until it's too late. But mm-hmm. you know, it's a it's a great question. It's all about it's all about the uh, Benjamins, you know. Yeah, and I think the parental rights are certainly uh, becoming more of an issue, uh, th- like what we've seen in Virginia. And once we're seeing all of these, uh, you know, crazy things like the you know the drag queen story time, but even worse than that in uh, in the CRT in the public education system, more and more parents are choosing alternative methods of education, and we're sure. seeing. Uh, that that really I don't think can be stopped. And so, you know, some great people you mentioned, Chris Rufo, um, James Lindsay, and Corey DeAngelis are also people to follow on um, these issues of CRT, school choice. Um, you know, a lot of really good information out there. But I think this is going to uh, spark a, a new trajectory of a demand that is pushing back um, against the, the teachers unions. And I think you're right, Ron, that that's really the underbelly of, of what's driving um, the public schools and the lobbyists from saying we don't want to have school choice options. But parents are going to override that objection and demand that. And we're going to see more cases like this. But I want to go back um, to something that you said a few minutes ago about um, incrementalism and also the separation of church and state. So those are two really fascinating discussions that we could have an entire episode on just those topics alone. But um, there is a, a common perception from the left that because this phrase separation of church and state was written in uh, by Thomas Jefferson to the Danbury Church describing the different spheres of authority, that somehow this phrase um, has become part of the nomenclature of uh, what the Supreme Court should enforce. And you and I disagree with that, but I want to get your um, baseline opinion on why we should relegate that phrase to the dustbin of history. Well, first of all, you know, everyone has a citation to the founding fathers for a, a point of view. I think it's fair to say that once you get past the Declaration of Independence, our reliance on Jefferson for statutory or constitutional interpretation falls off a cliff. And by now, you know, by the, by the time of the Constitution, the French Revolution is already bubbling. And he's he's on board. Okay, this this is now you and I are are not libertarians. We're more like what they used to call you know um, paleo conservatives. They're all old fashioned or Burkean conservatives. We're certainly cultural conservatives. Um, I'm not all that interested in what Jefferson had to say about it. Uh, Moreover, as you well know, anyone familiar with the history of uh, how the First Amendment um, Establishment Clause has been treated? I mean, again, it's it's complicated by, by the by the incorporation of constitutional rights into the Fourteenth Amendment. But even well after that, it has it has never been understood until you know fairly recently, by which I mean the last couple of generations. That the or that or has never been suggested that the purpose of the First Amendment was to avoid any kind of government endorsement of the idea of religion of some kind of religion. Rather, it was to avoid preference in 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 religion. Mm-hmm. And I just had this conversation with uh, of all people. Um, Michael Knowles for for my for the Col- for my podcast the Coleman Nation podcast as you so kindly mentioned at the beginning and, and go watch that's that you guys are both two soon. of my heroes so I'll, I'll thank you well he is it. such he's such a great guest he's so, he's so smooth and and he's, he's such a gentleman uh, he points you know he points out that in you know on the the issue of of um, 
Shirtliff that was that was decided a couple I guess about a month and a half ago, two months ago, the Boston City Hall case where the Supreme Court said this was really a speech case. Uh, you would have thought, but actually, to some extent, it, it turned on freedom of religion, and the and the Supreme Court said you can't have every flag on earth fly and then say when it comes to a Christian flag that that that's that's out of the question. And the reason I had to have Michael on the show because I had heard a an, a snippet from his podcast where he said, and now here come the sat- the so called Satanists can't even find real Satanists anymore. The so-called Satanists who say, okay, well, now, if that's how it's going to be, then put up our flag. Well, the, the existence of this group of Satanists is entirely for purposes of being able to say that and make, and, and make that point. And he says, no, there's no it, 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 we have a long tradition of common sense. And you know, to some extent, he's alluding to the sort of that, the kind of common good jurisprudence that in different forms uh, is advocated by our, you know, many of our friends here on the right, like Josh Hammer and uh, Adrian Vermeule. And, and, and Adrian doesn't necessarily see it as being the same, but the point is, judges don't have to shut their eyes to, as you said, reality. First, on the terms of the fungibility of money and the fact that if you're going, if if anything at all is going to go, is going to be sent from the state to a religious school, then guess what? It's going to be supporting religious educations. But there's nothing in the Constitution that that prohibits that, or that prohibits judges from saying, there's nothing in the First Amendment that says, we're about non-discrimination against particular religions. We're not, we're, the fact that you can posit some extreme position by calling yourself a Satanist, doesn't mean that you are welcome, that you're entitled to a place at the table. Now that might require us to actually do to, to depart from something, from from a longstanding First Amendment jurisprudence um, uh, approach, and maybe it's time to do that because of the lack of social consensus. And that is, the court always assumes when someone makes an assertion of of, of religious discrimination, it spots that party the sincerity of its beliefs. Mm-hmm. And we understand why it would have to do that. Uh, it would be an absolute wreck if it didn't. On the other hand, when you have people advocating for for things that they don't really believe, obviously, but are merely taking tactical positions in order to further an agenda that is actually meant to undermine the right and the values that that right is meant to protect, like what what say let so called Satanists do in, in this kind yeah, of they're they're literally I find it hilarious they're literally playing the devil's advocate and they're doing right. that hyperbolically <laughs> well, well, you know, saying but they, the Church of Satan. But they should, you know, well listen, my as I mentioned, uh, my friend Mark Rondaza, who who would not be comfortable having this dis- discussion or, or we, we it would have a, it would be a great discussion with 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 Mark because he he you know he he wouldn't he does not agree with us about religious matters but he always, you know, he was fired by the by the Satanists because he represented, as one must do if one's a First Amendment absolutist, as he is. He represented neo Nazis in a free speech case. Well, what kind of Satanists are offended by neo Nazis? <laughs> Those are your guys, man. <laughs> right, right. Well, and and to to not deal in reality and have these sort of hyperbolic uh, political opposition arguments just to. Uh, screw with the ultimate outcome and say, well, hypothetically, if this is so, so I'm thinking of as well, you know, the Church of Satan that is saying, well, we then will harness the pretext of religious liberty and say that abortion is part of our ritual and has to be excused because that is part and parcel of religious freedom. Um, it, it becomes ultimately absurd. And what they're doing is making a mockery of the judicial branch in interestingly the same way as one of the other cases today. Uh, the United States versus Taylor, which um, I, I loved uh, Justice Thomas's dissent in that case. And this was a criminal law context where the majority uh, written by Gorsuch actually created this kind of hypothetical defendant who and then they analogized um, a factual situation to say, well, you know, we can't apply this criminal law federal statute to the defendant here because hypothetically this other defendant down the line may Come and 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 Justice Thomas rightly said, "No, I would punish this guy for what he actually did. 
I mean, it just seems right, so right. plainly obvious that the justices need to parse certain things and they need to take an idea to its logical conclusion, but stay within the realm of reality, not say, well, you know, hypothetically, if Martians invaded tomorrow, how does that change our jurisprudence on, you know, war crimes theory? I mean, you well, could then, those those become arguments that are reduced to absurdity because right. they're not dealing in fact and reality. No, that's right. And, th and that goes back to our point about incrementalism. And, and yeah. you know, at one point, uh, uh, I guess it was last year, I wish I could remember, I remember the decision. I don't even remember the names of cases on the bar exam. Okay. I had to say the case with the scales in the, in the, in the train station. <laughs> um, but where, where, where Justice Alito s says, when is this court going to start paying attention to how federal litigation works? This case has, has come up and down and up and down. And we, decline to consider this, you know, we make these incremental, you know, adjustments and people are litigating for years and years and years. So here you're making a mockery of the judicial process. And it also makes a mockery of the, of the, of the right of the freedom of the, to the freedom of religion, right? Protected by the constitution, because you're saying anything I get up and say is going to be my religion. And as my wife reported in an excellent, um, Legal Insurrection article last December, where she uh, w was looking at the transcript for this for for this case for um, Carson, um, Justice I think it was Justice Thomas or Roberts who said is is critical racial studies a religion? I mean, at what point does a you know a non um, falsifiable set of beliefs that govern all conduct become a religion as opposed to, you know, a, a political point of view. Mm -hmm. And and that's where we are. So we either, if, if we don't, if we say that, that nihilism and Satanism and pantheism and uh, critical legal studies are religious beliefs, then what's left of the first amendment? First Amendment, at some point, we, we, you know, we need to go back to first principles. Well, of course, we're, pal we're, we're paleoconservatives. Of course, we're going to say that. But we need to ask ourselves, what is a religion? What is the yes. Constitution trying to protect here? But if we can't even say what a woman is. I was just thinking that. I was literally just going to say, speaking of Michael Knowles and the Daily Wire, I mean, this sounds like we're asking the same question of if we can't define what a woman is, then what is a religion? And so all of our jurisprudence is going to start going off the rails and not becoming coherent and not continuing to be coherent if the leftist framework gets their way that we can't even have some of these basic definitions. And then what happens to contract law? What happens to property law? What happens exactly. to all of these different areas of jurisprudence when we can't define our core terms? Well, Eric, so I, I had an episode two weeks ago with Eric Smith, the outstanding scholar at um, York College in Pennsylvania, a, a, you know, a, a, a black man who teaches people to think rationally and intellectually about wokeness and anti-wokeness. And he made a fantastic point, which was to say that def redefinition of terms has been a central to, and, and this is something everyone who, who knows the topic says, but he, he made, redefinition of terms has, is, has been central to the, to the Marxist onslaught on both academia and just the entire way we, we, we interact, whether it's in the ju judicially or even now medically, what, what, you know, what's the definition of a woman? What's the definition of a vaccine? And he made a fantastic point, which was that you'll notice how infrequent wokesters use adjectives. They do not use adjectives because they're not accepting the idea that you, that you are properly modifying a term with a, with a universally understood term. Instead, we're going to redefine that term to where we say it goes. And now marriage is, it's not same-sex marriage, it's marriage. Right. And, it, and, and it's not a transsexual woman, it's a woman. That's got to stop. It, it absolutely has to. And, and this is where the leftists and 
these these people who just say, well, we have to be inclusive of everybody. They're not thinking about uh, what the law describes as the ex ante or, you know, the principles of where do we go from here? What is the precedent that's being set here and how can we possibly uh, continue to have a civil society under any functional uh, definition and common definition? But this is where, you know, we go back to speaking of the common good and common sense and some of these things. Um, I think you're absolutely right that, you know, the founders, different particular arguments um, aren't necessarily persuasive, um, and they're certainly not binding on our current jurisprudence. The thing that's binding is the unanimous declaration of the founders that they recognized that our rights are pre-political, that truth is self-evident, and that we as a country recognize that our rights come from God, our creator, and not our government. And so we all agree on that unanimous declaration. And I think that's where we have to go back and say, okay, we unanimously agreed on that. And if we can come back to that, that ultimately is the definition of the common good. Because once that becomes up for debate, we are truly eroding our first principles and recognizing what our country is all about. And this is where, you know, so many people come at me and say, oh, well, you're just a Christian nationalist then because, you know, you believe in God and you think that that should influence uh, policy and politics. But the definition of good, the definition of what is criminal in society, the definition of what are our rights. I mean, all of these things that are at the core that you have to start with and that are foundational that you build up from there. If we don't have a consensus on that, and it's just my truth versus your truth, and I'm cabined into this perspective of Christian nationalists where they would tout, well, I'm just a nationalist. Their definition of good has to come from somewhere. And so when we ha when we argue and we have to argue our basic definitions, we just get completely sideways. So where where is the answer? And do you think that in a Robert sort of incrementalist, very um, scaredy cat, timid approach uh, to some of these things, is that going to serve us well uh, coming up combating things like CRT, combating these wrong labels like Christian nationalist and preserving and protecting the actual First Amendment idea of religious freedom? Well, you know, you've known me for a couple of years now, and if there's one thing you've picked up, if you ever do manage to see my tweets, it's that I I have a, an incurable optimism. So I'm going to try to spin Roberts optimistically, and I've been burned on by him before. <laughs> but for all, at the end of the day, he is actually, notwithstanding what people say, he's not a rhino, he's conservative. He is a traditional conservative. He 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 is terrified by anything that sounds that seems radical. And the advantage of that is that he can join in a conservative majority in a decision such as this one. And as he has joined in the vast majority, not necessarily the best known, but the vast majority of conservative, uh, uh, of conservative majority opinions. And apply the brakes on the, re on, on the rhetoric and Sometimes you and I agree on just how far the decision will go, but it does have the effect of softening the, the nature of the decision among serious-minded people. I mean, are the same lunatics going to be chaining themselves in front of the, the, court, the Supreme Court, you know, and, and, and walking around with b bloody baby dolls, you know, in front of Gorsuch's house? Disgusting. Look, the, these people are unhinged. The, yeah. the only reason they exist is because the media feeds them. But by and large, they they don't really represent mo hardly anyone. Um, so the real question, though, is, you know, if, if indeed politics, which was the one that was upstream, culture, politics, law is obviously a branch of politics for, for certainly purposes of, of this discussion. We, you know, to say that we need a cultural re reawakening is, you know, it's an act, it's axiomatic and something that's been said in American life since for a very, very long time. It's an old story. Uh, modernity and critical studies and Marxism and you know, just the entire challenge to traditional mores, families. And you know what? I'll give you one thing, Jenna. Women need to stay home with their children mm. and Absolutely. children and fathers need to be married to their, to, to the, to, to the mothers of their children, mm -hmm. you know, and as simple as that sounds there, you know, 
if people aren't going to do that, then people are going to be redefining things nonstop. I mean, what do we have? How many, I, I recently tweeted about this. How many times have you, have you seen people tweet about or write about or talk about their fiancés? These are fiancés that they've been living with for five, 10 years, and they have three children with their fiancés. Guess what? If he hasn't married you after, I said 18 months, and maybe certainly after 24 months, he's not that into you. All right, so there are exceptions. There are people who, you know, but conservatives have to model this behavior as well. And it, it's easier said than done. Not for us in my community, in the, in the strictly Orthodox Jewish community. You're either in and you're out. There's, there's no shacking up. And there's no out of wedlock uh, business. But, you know, I'm not in charge of the, I'm not in charge of the whole thing. I'm not interested in coercing anyone to be, to, to do things our way either. Right. At least through the government and, you know, church discipline is a very different question. And I think, uh, you know, the Bible is very clear on that as well. And uh, talking about religious liberty and people um, like I even had someone respond to me on Twitter today going, I'm really surprised that you're OK with um, the state giving money so that, you know, some parents could, for example, um, you know, send their kids to, uh, you know, a Muslim school. And I'm saying, you know, the government shouldn't be picking and choosing the whole idea of religious freedom and parental rights is that uh, parents can choose how to raise their children and what religious denomination they want to participate in. And that's not for the government to express. But certainly when we're talking about the definition of the traditional family, we're talking about things that are plainly, again, self-evident. Um, it is it That's just fact. And it's just true that it is a man and a woman that can create a child. And, you know, maybe you can get some science involved and you can do this artificially uh, nowadays, but that doesn't change the facts of biology. It doesn't change the definition of family, the definition of marriage, but it also doesn't change the responsibility of churches to impose church discipline on those other moral issues that shouldn't be, and I agree with you, should not be coerced to the state. And this is where, again, we have completely muddied the lines and blurred the lines here between what is the province and role of the state versus the church versus the parents in the context of a family. And the left and increasingly the right is looking to the state, unfortunately, to be the arbiter of all of these questions. And like a wise justice would say where, sorry, this is not my jurisdiction. I don't have jurisdiction to arbitrate this issue. That should increasingly be the state legislatures, that should be Congress, that should be the executive as well, saying this is not within the realm of state authority under our United States Constitution or even given uh, to the states under state constitutions. And so I hope that there is this um, great awakening and not a great reset uh, that the left wants, but a great awakening among conservatives of confining the government two first principles, uh, one of the chief principles being limited government and to not allow that to encroach into the province of the church or the family. Exactly. The church and the family, uh, you know, and you, you know, the things we saw uh, last fall in particular, you know, with parents showing up at school board meetings and being shut out, being arrested, being deemed domestic terrorists. Um, that shows you the nature of the war that's going on. And as I said at the beginning, the reason the the Carson case is is such a perfect law school fact check fa fact spotting uh, uh, you know decision is that you start with the premise that their state constitution guarantees a thorough, a thorough education or whatever the, the the language is for every child up to a certain age. Now, what's the government going to do? And in states that are much more urban, it's a, you know it's a given that the government is in charge of education, and every departure from that, every homeschooling or private schooling or parochial schooling, is considered to be an offense against the regime. And it doesn't have to be that way. We don't have to let it be that way. But if we're going to live in a world where the where there is such a thing as public education, I don't think we're capable of backing out of that. Um, then yes, you, you listen. There are things that are objectionable to Protestants that go on in Catholic schools, mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, and we can doctrinally go down a very, very long list. That's not the issue. The issue is if you're going to collect taxes from me for education, then I get to choose how my child is educated to the extent possible. 
Yeah. And, and that just seems to be so plainly common sense and rational. If you're going to collect taxes from a parent, a parent should be able to decide how to spend them for uh, the schooling and education of their own child, whether that is homeschool, whether that is private school, whether that's, you know, sending them to a public school. And, um, and that just, it, it makes so much sense. And so this is Amen. a great decision. And um, Ron Coleman, I really appreciate you coming on today to break this down and look forward to having more discussions. And uh, the philosophical conversations are always my favorite. And so thanks do. Uh, for that. And everyone, definitely um, subscribe. Where can they find your podcast? You can find it anywhere. Just try and avoid it. Uh, the, the website, the home for the for the podcast, in particular, if people want it, you know, it's on all the services, coleman-nation.com. Someone else got culmination. Uh, it, the joke is it's not the nation. It's the culmination. It's the <laughs> completion. Nice. Um, just search for Lawyer Ron Coleman podcast. You'll find that it. it's on YouTube. It's on Rumble. It's on a Cloud Hub. All the, all the cool places. Or follow, If you're following me on Twitter, you're not going to be able to miss it. And if you're not following me on Twitter, then why? You, no way you listened this far. It's impossible. <laughs> yeah, definitely follow Ron on Twitter. Uh, I think that you, was Jen. actually where we first got connected. And then I saw you were working with Harmeet. Right. And uh, of course, you know, then the friendship blossoms from there because Harmeet is a, such a great uh, attorney doing lots of great work. And um, thanks yeah. so much for the work My that pleasure. you do with her and to, for protecting yeah. um, our First Amendment constitutionally protected freedoms and liberties. And I look forward to having you on soon. Thank you. Legacy Precious Metals is the company that I trust to give you good and patient counsel for investing in your retirement. The Biden administration has caused a financial crisis and they have no clue how to fix it. Oil prices have skyrocketed and when oil prices go up, not only do your expenses go up, but the cost of transportation and shipping spikes, leading the prices of goods to rise. And when and we are already seeing record inflation. That's the last thing that we need. Our economy is in trouble and you need to take steps to protect yourself. If all your money is tied up in stocks, bonds, and traditional markets, you may be vulnerable. So gold is one of the very best ways to protect your retirement. No matter what happens, you own your own gold. It's real, it's physical, and it's always been valuable since the dawn of time. Call Legacy Precious Metals today at 866-528-1903 or visit them online at LegacyPMInvestments.com. That's LegacyPMInvestments.com where you can download the free investor's guide. You can also go to my Facebook page, Jenna Ellis. I am a public figure on Facebook and I just posted yesterday a really great interview with the president of Legacy Precious Metals who is discussing why you need to start your retirement account even if you're in your your 20s or 30s. There is always a great time to protect your retirement and invest just like you want to protect your health over the long term. So go to Legacy Precious Metals at LegacyPMInvestments.com or call 866-528-1903. Well, I also want to talk about another great American who is the sponsor of this podcast. And that, of course, is my good friend, Mike Lindell. He has been canceled out of so many box stores for simply standing up for his own political opinion and disagree or not uh, or support him or not. It is a fundamental right of every American to be able to voice their opinion, and that absolutely includes politics. That absolutely includes uh, issues that are central to our culture. That includes faith. Uh, Mike is such a very sincere Christian, and I am proud to consider him a friend, and he is, of course, a friend of this show. So right now, there is a special on MyPillow.com. Click on the new radio listener specials. Get deep discounts on all MyPillow products, including a great towel set, which is a six-piece set, it includes two bath, two hand towels, two washcloths, made in the USA, regularly $109.99, now just $39.99, but you have to use the promo code Jenna. That's J-E-N-N-A. That tells Mike that you listen to this show. You're happy that he is uh, a sponsor of this show and you will get great, great discounts, but use the promo code Jenna. That's J-E-N-N-A either at MyPillow.com or call 1-800-564-8475 and use the promo code Jenna.